Enemy set to lava! Welcome to another episode of the Lepanto Institute's General Quarters. Today we have with us uh, a young man who is a professional musician, Mr. John Gallo. John is married and his wife is about to give birth quite literally any moment. So if he gets up and bolts, you know why. John, great to, uh, great to have you and welcome. Thank you, Jim. Good to see you. Good. So uh, let's begin as we always do with a prayer uh, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of Victory, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. So we are talking today to John about his Catholicism. Uh, John had seriously discerned the priesthood and ultimately decided his vocation was in marriage. Uh, his story is very interesting uh, to me as both he and his wife are committed to the faith when sadly it appears a lot of young people you know, are losing ranks, particularly with the church is losing ranks, particularly with young people. But first a few points. If you like what we're talking about here, please pass this video along to friends and family. Uh, we're living in strange times and we are fairly certain we're you know, subject to being shadow banned. Also, please hit the subscribe button and the like button. If you'd like to be kept up to date with all the new content, uh, make sure you hit the bell. Lastly, before we get started, uh, it's important to point out that we only exist because of strong Catholics like you guys, who support us. So if you would like to donate, please consider www.lepantoin.org slash donate. That's lepantoin.org slash donate. So let's get to it. Uh, John, it's great to have you. Thank you. So uh, first, if you could, please tell us a little bit uh, about your life. Uh, we'll get to, you, to this later. I'm told you're quite a vicious guitar player, but uh, we'll get to that in a bit. But first about uh, discerning the priesthood, uh, ultimately marriage, and also the community of Santiago. Take it away. Okay, so <clears throat> this could be a you know, five-minute story or hour-long story. <laughs> it's a vocational discernment. But sure. um, I'll try to give the Cliff Notes version. Um, I was raised Catholic, so that meant you know, going to Mass most weeks, but not quite every week. Right. Uh, you know, my, my parents were... Um, not really well catechized, even though my dad went to 12 years of Catholic school. <laughs> but, but I mean, just to stop you right there, we, we, we talked about this when we were getting to know each other a little bit. And I also went to 12 years of, cat, of Catholic school and I was not catechized at all. And it was for my father and, and other people in the family. You know, again, this is one of the, uh, the culminations that happened post Vatican II where people just had no idea. But please continue. Right. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, my parents did the best they could, basically. And they took me to church and that kind of thing. And um, but even you know, I went to catechism at my church through the our CCD program, and um, didn't feel like I learned a whole lot. You know, it's <laughs> but anyway, yeah, I'll get to that. So um, I'm a you know I'm a teenager then and. Um, yeah, I have faith. I believe in God and pray. And some some of my friends from high school were like evangelical Protestant types. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. They invited me to their church events and things like that, and which really opened my eyes to a different perspective, I guess, of Christianity and and in its own good way, you know, encounters with God's love and good preaching and worship and stuff like that. Sure. So, you know, that's maybe age 16, 17 or so. And then I started, like, learning, wanting to learn. What is this? What is Catholicism? How is that different from what my, where my friends go to church? What, what kind of church do they go to? Like, what are all these different beliefs? And wondering, you know, what are other religions? Are other religions true? Is there a real religion that gives us the fullness of truth? And that was kind of where I was. I believed in God and prayed, like I said, but that's kind of where I was as a, in my later teens. So did a lot of my own research, you could say, and um, decided, yeah, okay, I think, I think God is real. I think Jesus is who he says he is, son of God. And it looks like 
the Catholic Church is the church that Jesus founded. So <laughs> if that's true, then that's it. And so that's kind of where I was as a, you know, I don't know, 18, 19, 20 or so, that kind of thinking. Right, right. And then, and then, and then you went to college, if I, you were at college during this point, right? That had a big effect, if I remember correctly. Yes, I went to Wayne State University in Detroit. And in my second year there, uh, a, a really great community of priests called the Companions of the Cross were invited to take over the um, the Newman Center at Wayne State. The Newman Center is the Catholic Student Center. Right, right, right. So those guys came in and I meet this young priest who's in charge of it. He's like in his early 30s, newly ordained and just a great guy, really loves God, really knows the faith. And so and anyway, throughout my time, there are a number of different companions, priests cycled in and out of there. And I got to know a lot of them, got to know a lot of their seminarians and just all really like real guys, cool guys, but who really love the church and love the faith and were committed to living, you know, a Catholic life. Sure. And um, so that's where I really grew in my faith a lot in college and those guys really, I would say, educated me and catechized me well. You know? and, and, and the Companions of the Cross, uh, for those at home, uh, the guy we would most associate with this in terms of social media would be Father Mark Goring. Yeah. Is that right? Right. Right, right, right. Okay. And so uh, that's that's cool. So they were, were you kind of, if I could ask, were you kind of shocked when you started to learn about uh, catechism and just go, ah, you know, because with me, it was a personal, uh, a consistent uh, I would say uh, sequential logic that really grabbed me. Tell, tell me about your experience there. Are you talking about um, believing the church to be true? Yeah, in the sense of the theology behind it and what the mass was about and, and things like that. Or, or maybe it was. Tell me about your your journey that way. Yeah, mine. Well, I was in my late teens, so it was a little more simple. I think it was. Sure. Um, it, well, first of all, is there a church that? goes all the way back to the time of Jesus. Did Jesus intend there to be a, a certain church, a certain way? Yep. Or did he just say, have at it? And <laughs> logically that doesn't really make sense. Right. Uh, and then I, and then I, somewhere in my, you know, reading Wikipedia pages, I learned about apostolic succession and, Oh, you can trace all the popes back and, Oh, um, a bishop gets ordained by a previous bishop and, you know, apostolic succession. And, oh, that makes sense. So, and then you read a, a little bit more about that and you see you know, breaking of bread, the Eucharist. You can kind of see, oh, that's, that's, the Catholic Church does go all the way back. And Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, that, that's a great point. Apostolic succession is, and then you, uh, you know, with me, I don't know if you hit, it would hit me also was, um, especially you mentioned evangelicals. And you can't help, you know, evangelicals, God bless them. You know, they're, they're our cousins, I guess. They, uh, they're solo scriptura, you know, the Bible, you know, the Bible only. And, and, and I get, I've gotten in many arguments about the, the Bible. Well, yeah, but it, uh, it actually kind of was the information was uh, disseminated and put together by the Council of Rome, Jerusalem, Constantinople. It was the, yeah, early yeah. Church that did that. And, um, that, that, uh, that pointing that out was met with much derision. So, uh, yeah, you know, generally speaking, but I, I had a very similar sort of epiphany too. And in, in a world of uh, relativity, you know, I mean, what are there 40 something thousand Protestant denominations? And after a while, it's, it's mind boggling. Right. You know, right. So, so, so but, then, I'm sorry, like, uh, oh, like Matt Fred says to be, uh, to know history is to cease to be Protestant, I think. Yeah, well, right. Really, I mean, it, it sounds mean, but it's true because, like, the Bible alone. Well, the Bible wasn't really totally together until the year, around the year three hundred or so. So, right, one hundred percent. I forgot. That's a great quote. Thanks for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. um, so then, all of a sudden, so you 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 meet these guys, you get a little form. Now, then, then you're kind of discerning the priesthood, right? Well, yeah, I would actually go back to when I was about eighteen, um, as I was kind of well, really loving, falling in love with the church and the sacraments and starting to be attracted to the church for the first time. Growing up, I wasn't really attracted to it, like most kids. You know, it's just boring. It's just what you have to do on Sunday. Right. But then as I, you know, started to learn and deepen my faith, I really loved the church and the sacraments and the Eucharist and going to Mass. And so I think out of that came a natural attraction to the priesthood. 
once you really know what the priest does, offering the the sacrifice of Jesus in persona Christi, once you get that, you can't not help but love the mass and love the priesthood. So as a you know, as an 18 year old, 19, 20, whatever, naturally I'm thinking there's that part of me that's like, oh wow, this is awesome. I'm attracted to the priesthood. But then there's that other part of me like, I don't want to be a priest. I want to be a guitar player. I want to get married. <laughs> so Fair enough. I, I basically wrestled with that feeling for a long time. And, and I guess that attraction and maybe confusing the attraction for being called to it. Um, but I, I just kept putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. I, I want to be a musician. I'm going to be a musician. You know, I, and I've always felt called to be a musician. So, so yeah, basically I just, yeah, I was attracted to the priesthood, but kind of just put it off, put it off. Yeah, I, I, I love that you just said, uh, even though I was attracted to it, it may not, I think you said it may not have been by vocation. The way that was like worded, that was like really cool. So uh, to the next part of this, which I love, because I did the same thing. Now, didn't you uh, hike the Camino de Santiago to, and, and place it in, please, Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I was uh, 25. Yeah, it was 2015. Me and a friend, a good one of my best friends from the Newman Center at Wayne State, so yes. a Catholic guy, we um, decided to hike the Camino. And we actually did the Portuguese route. Most people do the Spanish route where you start um, like southern France and go. I think it's the Francis route. I think they call it the Francis route or something. Okay. Maybe right. As in France, in France, but yeah, you you started. I just wanted that I did. You started Saint Jean Pierre de Port. And you walked to uh, Camp Santiago de Compostela. Right. So yeah, but go ahead. So that's what a lot of people do. Most people do. We thought, well, this Portuguese route is a little less traveled, and we can go to uh, Fatima on our way. That's great. So so we flew in to Lisbon and then took a bus up to Fatima, and. I mean, we we're two 25-year-olds. It was pretty unorganized. Like we, <laughs> we were just making it up as we went. But we got on the bus. We got to Fatima like the Tuesday evening. And that's we, the best way to go to the community of Santiago. Yeah, God that's, the rest anyway. Yeah, that's a good point. Go um, so we get there. It's like a rainy Tuesday evening. There's not much going on because it's just after Easter. We, we left right after Easter. I see. So there was like no one there. Um, we spent the evening there. We spent Wednesday there. And we didn't do any tours or any. Actually, the Basilica was closed because uh, they were making renovations for the 100-year anniversary. So we didn't. We couldn't even go inside the Basilica. So we didn't see much, didn't do much there. But, um, yeah, I when I was there, while I was there, I just prayed to Our Lady. I said, well... I had done a Marian consecration a couple of years before in college. Like a lot of people at my you know college had done it. So St. Louis de Montfort. Yeah. 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 Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. So I think when I was in Fatima, it was natural to just say, all right, I'm going to entrust my vocation to Mary. Our Lady. Yeah. 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 So I, I prayed that prayer and pretty simple, you know, I'm at the time, I'm 25, single, and just hanging out with my buddy who's also single, and we're hiking the Camino. And uh, man, I'll be honest, I did not break in my shoes well enough. Oh, you know? yeah. My feet were so swollen. Yes. On that. And it's be careful what you pray for, right? Because before I was like, I'm going to offer this for my vocation and, and, and um, offer the Camino, you know, in, in atonement for my life and, sure. and thanksgiving for my life so of course there there has to be suffering on the way um, <laughs> we we could do an entire show on the and, and i really want to have you back on that on the Camino de santiago but what people don't realize i i don't know how the portugal route was but on the called the francis route um it was not technically hard except for the first day first day was five thousand feet up or something like that or 4500 but uh, what they don't understand is when you're hiking 15 to 20 miles a day, carrying 30, 30 pounds approximately, that that's all fine for the first one or two days. But on day three, four and five, your feet get absolutely 
battered. Yeah. And, and, and so I know exactly what you're talking about. And if you don't break your shoes in, it just makes it worse. And I mean, usually most people I, uh, fall into that and they, they've got to take a couple of days off. Yeah. Or really get you know, real deep infection. But anyway, I mean, it's, it's, it's a little grueling. Uh, but yeah. And I had been backpacking before. But sure. it was in the Appalachian Mountains where we weren't walking on concrete or cobblestone. So I think, you know, walking on the ground, dirt was easier on my feet. Uh, yes. In the Portuguese route, anyway, you're a lot of times on cobblestone, like yes. roads built by the Romans, you know, and <laughs> built to withstand time. <laughs> so they're hard, you know. <laughs> well, <laughs> That's perfect. I swear to you, I did the same thing too because it's mostly paved. That's what I mean. Technically, it's not that rough, you know, but I'm going uh, after a while. You're just like, wow, this really hurts, man. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you, you know, we we're definitely going to do, uh, do a show on that. But you so um, Our Lady came through. Our Lady of Fatima came through for you. Right. And yeah, so exactly. you, a year later. Go ahead and, and, and go ahead. Tell me about that. Of course, it you know, it happens when you're not expecting it. That's why. <laughs> so I did the Camino in April of 2015. Yes. And. In March of 2016, okay, so, you know, less than a year later, I actually came down to Nashville to play a gig with an artist friend from Detroit. At this time, I'm living in Detroit. I'm from Detroit, and uh, I come down to Nashville with this artist to play a show. And this artist, she's in in college down here in Nashville, Belmont University. She hires this girl to sing backup on the gig, this girl who goes to school with her at Belmont. Okay. And um, so I meet this girl at the rehearsal and it's a beautiful Italian girl named Annalisa. <laughs> <laughs> who sings. I guess she is. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I, I overhear her say to someone, uh, I don't know if she went to mass on Sunday or something. And I'm like, oh, look, it's a beautiful Italian girl who sings and and she's in college, but she's still going to mass on Sunday. That's the, so we start talking and we hit it off right away. Of course, we have all kinds of things in common. Um, and so, yeah, we just, we started talking. I, I went back to Detroit, obviously, after the gig. <clears throat> and um, I actually had another gig in Nashville with the same artist, like a month later. Okay. April of 2016. So came back, played that gig, took Annalisa out on a date. And so that was going well. And um, seven months later, October of 2016, I moved to Nashville. Okay. And I had, you know, I spent time praying about it, of course, and talking to my parents, of course, and other musicians, uh, older musicians that I worked with in Detroit, who all really encouraged me to go. They said, as a musician, man, go to a bigger, go to a music city, you know, and go try it. You can always come back to Detroit if you don't like it or it doesn't work. So all the signs were saying, yeah, go, go to Nashville, try it. So October of 2016, I moved to Nashville and Annalise and I are dating at this time, full time. And um, so that's the case for the next about two years. I'm in Nashville kind of getting my roots down, making connections, start working. Annalise and I are dating. And um, it is Music so, City. It's music. It's a great place to be a musician. I'll tell you. I used to live there. Uh, it really is on fire with music. I mean, people don't realize they. Uh, you know, they, well, I guess they do. People are really good. Yeah. yeah. Continue, yeah. please. Yeah. Um. So okay, then Annalise and I have been dating about two years or so, two and a half years, and usually when you get to about that time period, it's all right. We got to make a decision here <laughs> we're either gonna get married or it's not or we're not gonna do sure. that so uh, you know i'll be honest like at that point the priesthood is still in my mind it never really went away still kind of nagging at me um and it just got to a point where i had to say to her like i can't i can't marry you with this nagging me I just can't. It would be. It wouldn't be fair to you. It wouldn't be fair to me. Our future. Our future. Our future kids. So, sure. unfortunately, I, I had to make that really difficult decision to say to her, "I need to figure this out. We're going to have to break up, and I don't know what's going to happen, but I have to get this figured out. I don't know how I'm going to get it figured out, 
maybe I enter the seminary for a while and become a priest. Maybe I enter the seminary for a while and don't become a priest. Maybe, who knows? But, <clears throat> as you know, so we broke up. And that was in November of 2018. 18, yes, okay. Yeah, November of 2018. So stopped, cut it, cut it all off with her, stopped talking to her, and um, just prayed every day. God, if you want me to be a priest, help me to want to be a priest. Because right now, I don't really want to be a priest, despite being attracted to it. And mm -hmm. honestly, that's where I was. And, you know, good priests who advised me, like, say, you know, if God wants you to be a priest, you'll, he'll help you want to be a priest. <laughs> um, so prayed that prayer every day for a couple months, at least. Interestingly, after a month or so, maybe two months, I, I noticed um, my desire to be married actually increased slightly, just sure. slightly increasing. Okay which was interesting because it's not like I had a burning desire to get married right away. So, but anyway, it's still not resolved. So I said, I'm going to just begin the application process for the seminary. And I chose to do it with the, this community of the companions of the cross. Cause I knew them, liked them, trusted them. It's all, all good. Um, so I think it's like end of January, early February, 20, you know, four or five months later, whatever, 2019, I guess. And um, I begin, I go on a, what they call a come and see retreat. You know, yes. where you, you go and stay with them for a week and there's other guys discerning. And I began the application process with them. And a number of things happened that were kind of like doors closing. Um, one was, it, it was the winter, the, the, you know, you have to do a psychological exam to yes. apply. The, the psychologist had slipped, you know, fell, broke her ankle, and I, I couldn't meet with her the whole time I was there. Um, and I had, you have to do interviews with priests in the community, you know, to when in the application. They had four interviews. Uh, each interview had a very profound thing that really said to me, like, this is not it. And um, one in particular interviewed with this priest, and I told him, where I was at. I said, look, I was dating this girl for a long time. I could see myself marrying her, but the priest was nagging at me. So I broke up with her and I've pr been praying every day. You know, God, if you want me to be a priest, tell me to want to be a priest, change my heart. And I tell him, I tell him this, the priest, and he kind of, he kind of smiles and sits back and he says, yeah, I, I had a real similar situation. He said, I was with, I was with this girl for a long time. And I was so in love with her. Yet I was thinking about the priesthood, and I said, I'll break up with her for a couple months and discern the priesthood and get back with her. Because there's no way I can't marry this girl. I'm so in love with her. And he said, well, I broke up with her. And as I was praying and going to adoration, over, slowly over time, I wanted to be a priest. And I kind of just forgot about her. Wow. So this priest is sitting there. We're in this interview, and he says to me, you know, you we it sounds like we did the same thing and had a different outcome yeah <laughs> yeah and so that so there was that and there were three other interviews each one with its with a really profound uh grace of clarity you know giving me clarity that this is not where god's calling me to well this is really cool really yeah. great. So yeah. were um well I left that retreat um, and, and there were other things, other conversations with other guys um, that were on the retreat and just so many good things that gave me so much peace that I'm not called to the priesthood. I can put this to rest. I can move on with my life. Sure. And um, So anyway, I left the retreat. I gave Annalisa a call <laughs> after. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah and um you know we we started talking again and slowly kind of got back together but that's another thing to important to note about marriage like 
Well, the, the religious life too is a two-way street discerning, but marriage is a two-way street discerning. <laughs> like you both have to be in. Yeah. And, and she, I can't say enough about how patient she was with me and still is and how loving and um, just, you know, amazing she is to me. So. Wow. Great story. I, I just, I, uh, I, start, I admit, I particularly like the story about, you know, well, I decided this isn't for me. Go back. That must have been a rough day. So I'm going to go call out Elise. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> but this is a great tie into something else. Um, you, you were good enough to watch uh, my interview with Dr. Janet Smith at Sacred Heart Seminary, which is where Companions of the Cross were sort of operating out of, right? Well, they send their seminarians there. Their seminarians do not live there. They live yeah. in community with the priests off campus. They, they study yeah, there. They, they go to school there, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, but uh, I, I said to you in, in that, I said to rather to Dr. Smith in that interview, you know, it was interesting for me that, you know, the summer of shame when we found out about the, uh, the clerical sexual abuse scandal uh, and addressed by the promise and it was actually worse cover up systemic corruption. And then the Pachamama, all of these horrible things were happening. And I, I mentioned that really, to me, it seemed uh, it actually strengthened my faith. It wanted me to get in the fight. And you kind of identified with that. Tell me about yeah. that as a young guy who's about to have a baby any minute. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, when you said that, I, I said, man, I felt the same way. I haven't heard anyone else say that. But yeah, I, I just I, I really meant it, too. It was like I didn't under and, and you you really I, I could hear in your voice when you told me. So tell me, uh, you know, it helps me, too. But tell me about that. Well, what you told me, and I completely agree, is it's so obviously evil and so yeah. obviously a, a direct attack on the church that it's not just human failure. Like, you know, all of us who are trying to be holy and be saints fail. But this is something else. This is like... Diabolic. Yeah. Diabolic. Yeah. 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 I, I, it was the first thing I thought of. And I'm so glad that that resonated with you because I'm just going, anybody else seeing this? I'm kind of going, they're, they're not going after the Hindus like this and or, you know, right. whatever, whatever. It just seemed odd to me, you know, it was like 2000 years of, of church history and clarity. And yet, you know, in the last hundred years, we've watched this slow incremental march that seemed to be uh, purposeful and uh, in many respects, brilliantly diabolical. Right. You, you know, if, yeah. And if you compare like the rest of church history and the saints, the, the writings and, and lives of the saints with what you're seeing now in the church, it's so obviously different. There's that too. Ah, yes. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, like the saints are masculine and I mean the, the, the male saints, of course, yes. but they're masculine and like badass is kind of a word. Right, like, right, exactly. Like, I read St. Saint, Saint Ignatius of Loyola's biography, and it's like, man, that <laughs> was not messing around. And any of them in the early martyrs and, um, and, and what you see in the church now is like so – it's like ultimate beta male. And, and well, I, I haven't heard that, and I can't tell you how much I agree. All I can think about as you're talking is Reverend James Martin and Ignatius Loyola. I'm going, huh? Yeah. 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 But, yeah, um, beta male. I got to write that down. That's just, exactly but, right. I, I, please continue with that thought. Like, that's not what the, what it's been. That's not no. how the church has been. So when you see such a drastic change in like the last 50, 70 years, it really. really what, what you to what you were saying and what we saw in 2018 with all this crap coming out, it right. it kind of makes sense. Yes. It, it makes sense. You know, it did. Uh, you know, it, it was interesting, too, because as I'm listening to you talk, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, Joseph and, and taking uh, Mary and the Christ child uh, away from Herod and, and you know, escaping to Egypt. And that was a tough trip. These guys were tough. You know, Ignatius Loyola, you just go right down the line. These guys, you know, right. Uh, you know, St. Thomas More. How about that guy? You know, and, and you know, I mean, it was like, hey. You know, all you got to do is just say yes, and you're back in the high life again. Even his own family was like, just sign the paper, you know. And you know, these guys, man, they really showed some character. Uh, and so tell me, now, I know uh, you and your wife go to Mass. You you, you pray the rosary together, or the divine chaplain. Tell me real briefly, uh, you're about to have a child any moment. 
you know, I mean, I know it's a big part of your life. I think it's a, a really cool story, uh, by the way. It's just with, uh, you know, frankly, I, I would think um, I, you look around church, you're kind of anomalous uh, in, in a way. And, and that's, you know, where we get a five. Tell me about your plan going forward, what, what you think, uh, all that good stuff. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, continue to be a professional guitarist here in Nashville. And um, my wife's a singer, so we play together. We play gigs together and things like that. So we we're kind of thinking, well, if we're, you know, we have a kid almost here and sure. probably more. So maybe we'll, uh, maybe we'll focus more on working together, playing music together. I love it. I love it. Which is even cool because you're, you're in the music industry, which is not uh, particularly an industry known for uh, personal discipline and virtue. Is that fair to say? Uh, um, yeah, yeah. Overall, overall. Uh, I know a lot, of, a lot of good people in the yes. industry, but but yeah, overall, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just think, I, I just think, I just think. Anyway, uh, John Go, I got to tell you, I I thoroughly enjoyed talking to you. You're a really good young guy, and uh, I, I wish you and your family the best, and, and especially uh, you know the greatest thing ever is going to happen to you guys very shortly. And, yeah, uh, our prayers are with you. Yeah, I, thank you, Jim. Thanks for having me, and uh, thanks for having me on. I. And I want to hear more about, you know, what you do and. Absolutely. No, no, we'll, we'll talk again. In fact, I, I really want to bring you back for this show. I want to do a show um, on the Camino de Santiago because I, and, and maybe the word, I, I, um, there are very few times in life in, 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 in the modern world where you're going to take your phone, turn it off, and you're just going to listen to God and you're going to pilgrimage with nothing but the things on your back. And, um, I did it as a solitary journey and it was absolutely wonderful. And you can't, you know, I think that to uh, encourage people to do something like that is so important because we're, we're losing our way, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I, you and I, again, we talked about the community of Santiago. God really speaks to you out there. Mm -hmm. in, 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 you don't meet anyone by accident. You don't, right. You know what I mean? There's some people you kind of have to, you away but for the most part you know I, I really interesting folks and uh uh it's a very very uh oh God, I, I say meaningful journey and and i would really encourage anyone to do it so we, you know you put your phone away you turn things off and and yeah and you you move you physically move every yeah. day and, yeah and, and we'll give and you go ahead sorry john it's so um representative of life you don't really, you have a plan, but you don't really know what's going to happen or where you're going. That's really true. You're putting one foot in front of the next. And, <laughs> and that's such a great, that's such a great, because, uh, yeah, you, you sort of have a plan, but, you know, you're constantly getting thrown curveballs. And then when you look back, much like on life, you go, wow, you know, God really had my back there, you know? I mean, there's one time, I mean, like, I was five miles from the nearest town, just, just, just downpour, you know? So, wow, this is going to be rough, you know, and, and, and you found out why that happened. It was, it was just tremendous. But, mm. uh, and listen, also for everyone at home, we're going to, uh, we're going to put some uh, information in the show notes about how to get in touch with Mr. John Gallo, uh, Mr. John Gallo, uh, magnificent, vicious guitar player. I've actually seen videos of him play. It's very impressive. And, uh, you know, that way, if you want to get in touch with him or anything like that, but uh, on that note, uh, if you are, it looks like we're about, about to wrap it up before we go. It's important to point out that we only exist because of uh, good Catholic folks like you. So again, lepantoin.org slash donate. That's lepantoin.org slash donate. Or a second way is uh, to help out the Lepanto Institute. If you're looking for a great gift for yourself or someone, please um, visit our store, lepantocatholicgifts.com. We have a, uh, a beautiful uh, Lepanto cross. Uh, it's soft silver and frankly it's beautiful uh, michael hinchborn designed it and he fully credits uh, inspiration for our lady with the design and uh, we're selling this as a sacramental and we're really strongly urging you to get it blessed as well the church uh, the chain is either in sterling silver uh, or leather you know so depending on what your uh your particular preference is and we wish again to thank mr john gallo for taking the time from his busy schedule and uh, with a new addition to his family, about to show up at any minute, and I'm, I'm not kidding. Thanks again, Johnny. Thanks for having me, Jim. You got this is Jim Mon uh, from General Quarter saying goodbye. Right. Bye bye.